Aikido is both comparable to a circle and to water. It is harmonious and non-resistant, but capable of great dynamic and force. Like water flowing around a rock, its distinctive defensive style utilizes the attacker's aggression and energy to either direct it away or back at the aggressor. Its efficient use of energy, specifically in the control and conscious relaxation, becomes apparent in a demonstration deemed the unbendable arm. First, a partner places their hands on your arm. The goal is for your partner to collapse your arm and for you to resist as long as possible. By resisting, blood vessels inside the arm are constricted, and while the arm may be very sturdy, once the ATP reserves run out and lactic acid builds up, the arm will collapse. The arm collapses, and each additional time, the muscle becomes weaker. Now, by not resisting and allowing an increased blood flow to the muscles and only toning the specific areas necessary, it is possible for someone to resist for an extended period of time, even when they are physically weaker than the aggressor. Isotonic contraction of the tricep brachii make this possible, as well as skeletal posture, routing the energy down into the floor by keeping aligned with the sagittal plane. Essentially, this concept of efficient, voluntary muscle use is what makes Aikido so potent. All this video is to examine a technique by the name of Kote Gaish, how it works from a physiological point of view. Kote Gaish works by manipulating the attacker's wrist, elbow, and shoulder. Joints of the wrist, elbow, and shoulder are synovial joints. Joints in which the articulating bone ends are separated by a joint cavity containing a synovial fluid. All synovial joints have four distinguishing features. 1. Articular cartilage. Articular cartilage covers the ends of the bones forming the joint. 2. Fibrous articular capsule. The joint surface are enclosed by a sleeve or capsule of fibrous connective tissue, and the capsule is lined with a smooth synovial membrane. 3. The joint cavity. The anticular capsule encloses a cavity called the joint cavity, which contains lubricating synovial fluid. Number four, reinforcing ligaments. The fibrous capsule is usually enforced with ligaments. The types of synovial joints are as follows. Plane, hinge, pivot, condyloid, saddle, ball, and socket. The wrist is classified as a plane joint. A plane joint has anticular surfaces that are essentially flat, and only short slipping or gliding movements are allowed. The movements of the plane joints are non-axial, that is, Gliding does not involve rotation around any axis. The elbow is classified as a hinge joint. In a hinge joint, the cylindrical end of one bone fits into a trough-shaped surface on another bone. Angular movement is allowed in just one plane, like a mechanical hinge. Hinge joints are classified as uniaxial. They allow movement around only one axis. There is a ball and socket joint. The ball and socket joint has a spherical head of one bone, which fits into a round socket in another. These multi-axial joints allow movements in all axes, including rotation, and are the most freely moving synovial joints in the human body. So let's take a look at the Kote Gaish technique. Extremely simple, the technique consists of various complexities relating to balance, timing, and muscle control. The defender, or nage, places his hand on top of the uke, or attacker's hand, and grabs with maximum service area. By controlling this area of the hand, stress can be isolated onto the plane joint of the aggressor's carpals. The defender steps out, keeping his hand and the attacker's hand in line with his center, or sagittal plane. This pulls the attacker off balance and generates stress on his carpals. The pressure travels up through the attacker's hand to their shoulder, and in an effort to protect the joint, the body naturally falls to relieve the stress. The stress being put on the attacker's carpals is due to force causing supination, or external rotation. We can see this more clearly from a first-person point of view.
Surprisingly, the vast majority of the technique emanates from the hips, not the arms as one might expect. The main job of the defender's arms in this technique is to keep a line in front of the rectus abdominis along the mid-sagittal line. This is because, similar to a boxer's punch or a baseball pitcher, power is emanated from the core of the body and travels through the structure into the attacker's joints. Once the attacker is on the ground, putting him into the pin position is rather simple. The defender internally rotates the hand, or pronates it, causing the body to naturally roll over onto its interior to relieve the stress. Now all that remains is a submission. In English, this pin is called a pronating wrist lock. By applying downward pressure onto the hand, the wrist will become maximally pronated and may even hyperflex on. Additionally, the pressure will be put into the ball and socket joint of the shoulder, causing immobilization and pain. Again, not much force is needed to subdue the attacker. People who are of inferior strength and fitness can perform the technique with ease so long as their body posture is correct.